Hello, good morning. Uh, let's look at a lecture on the West. This is going to be the first of two lectures for the next to last week. Next week, believe it or not, is the last week of the semester. Summer semesters always go by so fast. All right, so let's start with manifest destiny. This is going to be a term that is very popular in the 1840s. And it describes this belief that Americans were destined by God to spread their beliefs across the continent. And these are two of the most famous paintings that depict the idea of manifest destiny. In the top one, you have all the wagon trains and all the pioneers moving west to look for unseen or unfamiliar lands. And in the bottom, you have Lady Liberty moving towards the west with all these trains and all these settlers moving west as well. Now, why? Why did Americans do this? Uh, they thought it was their sense of duty to spread the, their idea of civilization. It was their duty to spread this idea of democracy. And they, who were they spreading it to? The, quote, barbaric Native Americans. And in the 1840s, Americans would stop at nothing to spread these ideals. Uh, they're going to be spread to Mexico and Native Americans, whether those populations wanted it or not. And Manifest Destiny is going to be used to make atrocities and persecutions okay. Almost every president of the 1840s is going to run for president on a a platform of expansion. Uh, you've got William Henry Harrison, who's all about expansion, John Tyler, you've got James K. Polk. Uh, for example, William Henry Harrison is famous for defeating Tecumseh and famous for defeating, defeating Prophet. And so he had no problem liberating land from Native Americans. We also have gold being discovered in California in 1848, causing a gold rush in 1849, and thousands of people moving to California as well. Now, how were they getting there? Well, during the early 1840s and early 1850s, several thousand Americans are going to migrate to the north west coast along the Oregon and California Trail. Now, these settlers, they knew they were going into British territory or Mexican territory, but they just, they really didn't care. There's going to be some negotiations with Britain who technically owned the or Oregon Trail territory, and the United States and Britain are going to sign a treaty that gives the Oregon Trail territory to the United States. Now, what was the Oregon Trail itself? It was a trail that stretched from Independence, Missouri, all the way to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. It was so heavily traveled that even today in 2021, in certain places, the remains of the Oregon Trail can be seen. By 1843 alone, we have over a thousand pioneers, over 125 wagons, and 5,000 cattle setting off for the Pacific Coast, a place they've never seen before. By the time the traveling was all done, there are over 85,000 people who do the traveling. California Trail is a little less known, but it is probably just as important. It also started in Independence, Missouri, and then it traveled to the gold fields of California. Uh, it was a trail that had existed for years. It had existed since the 1800s, the early 1800s, but it wasn't actually laid out. It wasn't mapped out until a guy named John C. Fremont, who was with the U.S. Army, put it on a map in 1843 and 1844. By the time the gold rush starts, 
you've got about 30,000 people per year going to California. And then by 1850, that number is up to 55,000. And all total, about a quarter of a million people traveled to California along the California Trail. Now, the least known of these three trails is the Santa Fe Trail. And it went from St. Louis, Missouri, all the way to Santa Fe, Mexico, now New Mexico. And it became the primary trading route between the United States and Mexico, in addition to being a settlement route as well. Now, the big question is where did they not go? And that would be the Great Plains. The Great Plains were seen as the Great American Desert. In other words, the Midwest. We're talking Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Kansas, um, Iowa, Oklahoma, Wyoming, all those places. And the big reason that nobody moved there is because it had an arid climate. It didn't rain very much. It was completely flat, a lack of trees. And because of all of those features, the, the dryness, the flatness, the sparseness, it was considered inhospitable. And early settlers crossed it on the way to the Willamette Valley of Oregon so that they wouldn't live there. And because it was seen as so inhospitable, that was the prime area for a Native American relocation. And that's one of the big reasons why there are so many Native American re reservations in the Midwest and in the Great Plains today. Now, what were conditions like? Well, first of all, I want to tell you that Hollywood is not correct. Um, <clears throat> it looks like it's all tumbleweeds, cowboys, Indians, Western-style movies, and that's very, very far from the truth. Uh, no shootouts happening all the time. <clears throat> no gun battles, nothing like that. Sorry to break your heart. In reality, only about... 5% of the deaths on the Santa Fe, Oregon, or or, or uh, California Trail were because of Native Americans. In fact, most wagon trains never see a Native American, and those that do, they're often met with friendly relations, and they're given food, water, shelter, and told which way to go. Uh, there are a lot of deaths, though. Uh, more than 20,000 people die along these trails moving out west, and most of those deaths are because of disease. Uh, you get cholera from unclean water, you get garlic fever, uh, you just get straight-up starvation, and then accidents as well. If you've ever played the game Oregon Trail, you're probably familiar with the term, you have died of dysentery. Um, it's, it's a rough go. You pack up everything you've ever known and you move someplace you've never been and you never get to go back where you came from. Now, the most famous group to move west was the Donner Party. It's the best example of death I can think of on these trails. Uh, George Donner, he was a prominent and well-to-do farmer from Illinois. And he's going to lead his family and some others from Illinois down the Oregon Trail. Uh, but the trip's doomed from the beginning. Uh, he leaves too late. He leaves in late spring instead of early spring. He takes more of, of his stuff than he does supplies. So there's going to be a shortage of food. And then they decide to take a shortcut across the mountains of Utah. But remember, there are no GPSs. There's no maps. They're just kind of winging it when they do this. Now in the mountains, they meet up with another group and they say they're going to California. So the Donners, in the middle of their trip, change their destination. And they all decide they're going to go to California together. Well, when they get lost around Salt Lake City, they lose wagons who they break, their livestock starts to die. And then eventually they end up in the Sierra Nevadas, which are the mountain range that is on the border of Montana and, and Nevada 
in Idaho and in that area along with California. They get caught in the surprise two week snowstorm that they are in no way prepared for. And in order to survive, they resort to cannibalism. They start to eat each other. Only seven people actually make it to California. And those seven people tell the authorities what's happening. And a search party is sent for the rest. And when they get there, there are only 47 out of the original 81 left. It's pretty, pretty gruesome. Now let's also look at Texas. The American settlers are going to begin moving to Texas as early as the 1820s. Mexico wanted people to settle Texas because Texas was part of a newly independent Mexico. And Mexico was offering large tracts of fertile land and cheap land to Americans who were willing to move there. Now there were a couple of, of catches. Number one, no slavery. Mexico outlawed slavery. So the settlers from America who moved into Texas, they kept their slaves by calling them, quote, lifelong indentured servants. These Americans who move in have to convert to Catholicism because Mexico was a Catholic country. Well, most of the American settlers were Protestant and they just converted in name only and didn't do anything Catholic except say hi, I'm a Catholic. And then finally, because you know Mexico is its own country, Mexico insisted that settlers in Texas pay duties or taxes on imported goods from the United States. And most settlers resisted that and they smuggled in American made goods as often as they could. So things aren't going well between these American settlers living in Texas and the Mexican government. By 1935, these tensions have reached a boiling point where something's going to happen. And that something happens on March 6, 1836. Uh, the Mexican government had turned an old Catholic mission into a base of operations to watch the, the uh, American settlers in Texas. And by this time, those American settlers have taken on the name Texican. In 1835, the Texicans, they take over the Alamo and they're going to use this for their base of operations. Fighting continues and eventually on March 6, 1836, the Mexican army is going to surround the Alamo and the Mexican army is going to take the building back. Now, contrary to what you say, and I apologize if you are a Texan or if you have family in Texas, um, this was a Mexican government building that was illegally taken over by the American settlers in Texas, and then the Mexican government took it back by force. Um, somewhere between 200 and 250 Texans died or Texicans, I should say. But this becomes a rallying cry for the Texas people. So in 1836, the settlers, they vote for independence from Mexico. Sam Houston is named president. And after less than two months of fighting, the Mexican dictator, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, is forced to sign a treaty that recognizes Texas as an independent republic. Now, the Alamo it becomes a symbol of Texas liberty because all these men died for their beliefs. They, they, and because the fighting continued after the Alamo, many believed it showed the Mexicans that they weren't backing down. And in reality, what Texas wanted wasn't independence so much as it was to be annexed or brought into the United States. Almost as soon as Texas declares its independence, its representatives are going to meet with Andrew Jackson in 1836. But that's Andrew Jackson's last year in office, so he doesn't do anything. Also, the U.S. government, they don't want to go to war with Mexico. They want to do everything they can to avoid it. Plus, on top of that, you have the beginning of the anti-slavery movement. And so there was no real drive to add a new state at that time. 
because anti-slavery forces in the North, they were completely resistant to the idea of annexing Texas. If they did that, the scale of power would be tipped in balance of the slave states instead of being equal. So Texas is going to end up being an independent country from 1835 all the way until 1846. And that is one of the reasons that the Texas state flag can be flown at the same level as the United States flag. In fact, if you ever go to Texas, there are two flagpoles, one for the Texas flag and one for the American flag. But what happens to Texas? And how does it become a state? Well, in 1845, Congress is going to formally vote to annex Texas. Now, I know that this is going to cause a war with Mexico, but in 1845, the U.S. government feels much more prepared. The president in 1845 is James K. Polk, and he's going to send a negotiator to Mexico to try and, and negotiate with Mexico to recognize the independence of Texas and to purchase the California Territory and the New Mexico Territory. Unfortunately, this negotiator is not received by the Mexican government because Mexico is having its own problems. Basically, the Mexican Revolution, or a Mexican Revolution, was on the verge of happening because everybody hated the Mexican president. Eventually, a negotiator is able to get in and talk to the Mexican government, and when they discuss the terms, they begin to argue over boundaries. And this dispute over the southern boundary of Texas is going to really be what brings on the Mexican-American War. Uh, Mexico claims one river as the boundary of Texas. James K. Polk tells the negotiator to say that a different river is the boundary. And in reality, the land between the two rivers is completely you know, uninhabitable, but it was a huge chunk of territory, and that's what they were fighting over. Basically, if you will. Now, James K. Polk ultimately believes that this land is part of the Louisiana Purchase anyways, and really it belongs to the United States. And so Congress is going to vote to annex the Texas territory using the Rio Grande as the border. James K. Polk signs off on it, and Mexico gives command. Almost as soon as Congress votes to annex Texas, the Mexican government, they begin war preparations, and in response, James K. Polk sends U.S. troops into Texas to occupy the territory. So the Mexican-American War is going to begin on April 25th, 1846. It lasts a little under two years. It ends on February 2nd, 1848. And Mexico finally surrenders when U.S. troops invade Mexico City. Now, the end result of this is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that's in 1848. Mexico is going to give the United States most of the Southwest and most of its Pacific territory. And that is how the United States gets California, Nevada, Utah, most of New Mexico, and most of Arizona. So by 1848, the United States as we know it is almost complete. The only thing we really have left to add are Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, and this little piece of land at the southern tip of New Mexico and Arizona. Well, the United States gets that southern tip of New Mexico and Arizona in 1853 with something called the Gadsden Purchase. And the whole reason that that was purchased is so that a railroad can be built across the southern part of the United States. Oh, and if you're curious where Alaska comes from, 1867, the United States is going to buy Alaska from Russia. All right, the last topic for this lecture is immigration. Between 1776 and 1812, immigration into the United States almost completely stopped, and that was because of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars that all restricts travel outside of Europe until about 1815. But almost as soon as the Napoleonic Wars and as soon as the French Revolution have calmed down, 
immigration picks up again. Um, 1825, we have 11,000 immigrants per year. 1830, that's up to 23,000 per year. By 1840, 84,000. And the numbers just keep going up from there. Uh, between 1840 and 1850, we have almost 2 million immigrants that come to the country. And then in the 1850s, that is almost 4 million. Most of these people are coming into the United States through New York City. And you have more than 40 ships per day docked in the port of New York. But we didn't have Ellis Island yet. So they basically just got off the ship and they had to fend for themselves. Uh, some of these people find family members who have already arrived. Others try to find housing and jobs that day. They were literally, literally just off the boat and have nothing to do. Others were a little more organized and they'd already purchased some land or they'd done some research before they got there. And there were even some of these Europeans who purchased land before they left Europe and then find out that their purchase was a scam and then they're just kind of left here with no money. In 1855, the immigration office at Castle Garden is set up in Manhattan. And for the first time, the names of the people are recorded, their nationalities and their destination. They're given a brief medical exam and the labor bureau reps will help them find a job. And you might be curious also who these immigrants were. Uh, we have the Irish who start coming over after 18. 45 because of the potato famine. Uh, the famine killed more than a million peasants in Ireland, and so the United States begins to be flooded by Irish people along with Canada. By 1851, there are over 200,000 Irish living in the United States, and that's about 43% of the entire foreign born population. Most of the Irish coming over were tenant farmers, that meant they worked on land owned by someone else. Others work in industries, build railroads, work in construction. Uh, women are going to work as maids, laundry, seamstresses, and then some of these Irish women even go to factories. Most of the Irish don't have money to move west. They are going to stay in Boston and New York City or other places in New England. And because the Irish are almost 100% Catholic, uh, they are going to really strengthen and add to the numbers of the Catholic Church in the United States. Germans are going to come over here in the 1840s. And a few in the 1830s, but 1840s really, and 1850s especially. And a lot of this has to do with revolutions in Germany. Germany at the time was a series of independent kingdoms, like 30 or 40 of them at this point, and they all have different types of revolutions against their, their princes. Well, a lot of these revolutions failed, and so the people of Germany who were revolutionary ended up having to leave. Now, unlike the Irish, many of the Germans were educated professionals, doctors, lawyers, educators, engineers, and with them, they bring the ideas of Marxism. In other words, the labor movement and the push for labor union. About a third of them were Catholic, but many were Protestant as well. But their ideas of Protestantism are different than the Protestantism that's already in the United States. So you have tensions with the United States and these German immigrants. You have religious tension as well with the part that's Catholic and then the part who's a different denomination of Protestantism. And then the established American German community didn't look favorably upon these new German communities as well. They have old Germans and new Germans not really getting along. Uh, the old Germans, they feel superior because they were here first and they see these new Germans as outsiders. And because these new Germans have money when they come over here, they tend to move west, which is one of the reasons you find a lot of German ancestry in places like Chicago and Milwaukee and other places in Wisconsin. 
Now, there are other immigrant groups. Uh, the Irish and the German, they do dominate, but we also see spikes in British immigrants. They're mostly professionals. There are some farmers and skilled workers. And the professionals and the skilled workers are mainly coming to the United States to help with industrialization. You have some Scandinavians. Uh, they largely settle in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Northern Illinois, uh, mainly because the climate reminds them of coal. And there are still entire communities of Swedes in the Midwest. Uh, my family is from a place called Rockford, Illinois. Rockford, Illinois has Scandinavian cemeteries, Scandinavian school systems, Scandinavian museums, Scandinavian language, and Scandinavian food. I'm just going to tell you right now, Swedish food is pretty good if you've never tried it. By the 1850s, with development in California, we get Chinese people coming over in large numbers. And the Chinese people are really going to be involved in the mining operations. Remember, that's the height of the gold rush. And the Chinese people are going to build the railroads as well. Now, with all this immigration, there is tension. There is what we call xenophobia. You have Protestant versus Catholic. With all the Irish and German Catholics coming in, there was a fear that the United States would become heavily influenced by the Pope. The Pope in the 1800s was much more powerful than today. Today, in many ways, the Pope is just a figurehead, but in the 1800s, a lot more power. So there's this anti-Catholic sentiment that's going to become really strong, and there's a political party that grows out of it. This political party is known as the Know Nothing Party, and members of the Know Nothing Party, they vow to never vote for any Catholic or foreign-born candidate in an election. They were very strong in New England. They had quite a following in Massachusetts legislation. Their influence is spread to New York and Maryland, but they do die out when the issue of slavery takes precedence. We have a, a growing tension over ideology. We have Marxism versus capitalism. Uh, Marxism mostly focuses on the area of labor, and as workers are starting to become more organized, they're going to push for better pay, better work hours, they're going to want to join unions, get vacation time. And all the tension in factories and all the tension on farms are being blamed on immigrants coming from Germany because they are talking to workers about Marxism and socialism. Now, there were labor unions as early as 1802, but these are going to be pretty much local trade unions where they get together and talk about trade issues. Uh, they're going to be in just the largest cities, the largest towns. But by the 1830s, unions begin to change and unions begin to take on more of a national focus. And they talk less and less about trade and more and more about workers' rights. By the 1840s, labor unions begin to call for labor reform, which makes politicians nervous. And then we start to get protests and strikes and, and shutdowns and everything else. Because of all this immigration and all this population growth, this influence from British industrialism, the United States is going to become more and more advanced technology-wise. And we just move further and further and further into the market economy from the moral economy with all of this immigration. Now, things will change during the 1850s, and we'll start talking in the next video about this change where the tensions really, really rise, and we get closer and closer and closer to the Civil War. But that will be in the next video, not this one, so you'll have to stay tuned. All right, we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.